delighted to introduce you through this webinar to a new Family Planning Decision Support Tool for Primary Healthcare Nurses in Australia, developed by APNA with funding from the Australian Government. Australia has one of the highest rates of unplanned pregnancy of Western countries with an estimated one in two pregnancies being unplanned or mistimed, and one in three pregnancies ending in induced abortion. Despite the increasing availability of contraceptive methods over recent decades, these statistics have essentially remained unchanged. Unplanned pregnancy is an important health issue for Australian women across reproductive life and is associated with increases in morbidity and mortality for mothers and babies, and higher overall healthcare costs. Australia has infant mortality rates three times higher than the best performing countries. In recent National Health Performance Authority Child and Maternal Health Report 2009 to 2012, encompassing infant and young child mortality, low birth weight, smoking during pregnancy and access to antenatal care shows that even within Australia there is a marked difference in infant and young child death rates between the areas where the rates are lowest and the areas where they are highest. Results for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mothers and babies were generally less favourable than non-Indigenous. Even in comparing similar groupings with each other, there were sometimes very large discrepancies, particularly in the percentages of women who smoke during pregnancy. Health practitioners in general practice and other primary healthcare settings have a key role to play in addressing this issue and are in an ideal position to provide contemporary care, advice and education. Managing adolescent fertility is a particular concern. Australia's teenage pregnancy rates are higher than many other developed countries. Pregnant young women are at an increased risk of low birth weight babies, mental health issues and long-term social hardships. Primary healthcare nurses are in a position to identify young women at risk of pregnancy and implement strategies to help them make informed choices. At the same time, as we all know, many people who wish to conceive have difficulty and need good advice on healthy conception. Primary healthcare nurses are ideally placed to play a greater role in this area through targeted lifestyle interventions, promoting fertility health and knowledge. Assisting nurses to advise patients well can help reduce comorbidities and complications of pregnancy and support appropriate use of assisted reproductive technology where necessary. The APNA Family Planning Phase 2 project developed the decision support tool for primary healthcare nurses in Australia to assist nurses in their consultations with patients and to promote effective family planning throughout reproductive life. I would like to introduce you to our presenters tonight. Ruth Mercer is a nurse practitioner and conjoint lecturer at the University of Newcastle with a strong background in sexual and reproductive health, who has been engaged by APNA as an expert consultant to assist with developing this decision support tool. Ruth has had an extensive experience working as a nurse in general practice, which makes her a perfect candidate to lead this piece of work. She has been assisted by a very knowledgeable, knowledgeable reference group and will be joined tonight by one of the members, Joanne Perks, who is a nurse practitioner who has worked extensively in women's health services in New South Wales for over 20 years, lectures at various educational institutions, and is passionate about holistic primary health care and improvising outcomes, improving outcomes for her clients. Please welcome Ruth and Jo. So, hello everyone. So why decision support tool? Randomised control trials have shown that decision making aids in family planning improve the quality of family planning consultations for practitioners and patients. A Cochrane review concluded that even simple, simple versions of decision making aids improve patient knowledge outcomes when compared with mutual care. A national and international literature review by APNA in January 2014 found that there was limited, limited readily available decision support tools for primary healthcare nurses working within the Australian general practice setting to use as a pathway to assist patients in assessing information and guidance and planning fertility and reproductive healthcare. Patient decision aids help people participate in decisions about their healthcare by providing information about options, risks and possible outcomes and by clarifying personal values. They are designed to complement rather than to replace counselling from a healthcare professional. We're just now going to have um, some polls through our webinar 
and we'd just like you to ask some simple questions. We're going to ask you some simple questions, but just like some um, response if that's okay. So the first question is, would you normally have conversations about family planning with your patients? <clears throat> So it's interesting that we get quite a fair mix, about 46% of people said that they actually would have a conversation with their patients in general practice. About 17% have said no, and about 36% have said yes. So hopefully the decision support tool might encourage the people that were maybe or no to actually start using the decision support tool in initiating conversations with their patients in general practice regarding fertility and general and family planning. Some recent um, research has come out um, and a report was documented by the Healthy Communities Child and Maternal Health Report. It was recently released in 2014 in July. The report looks at fa factors and figures from 2009 to 2012. Some, interest some interesting statistics regarding low birth weight babies. Across local areas, the percentage of all live births of the low birth weight babies was more than double in the catchment with the highest percentage compared to the catchments with the lowest percentage. So the percentage of low birth babies ranged from 7.7% in the Northern Territory compared to 3.3% in Sydney's North Shore and Beach areas. The results were interesting regarding smoking as well. So smoking during pregnancy, the national percentage of women who smoked during pregnancy was 13.9% for all women in this particular um, space in time and 51.7% for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island women. Across local areas, the percentage of women who smoked during pregnancy was 18 times higher in the catchment with the highest percentage compared to the catchment with the lowest percentage. So the percentage of women who smoke during pregnancy ranged from as high as 33.1% in far west New South Wales compared to 1.8% in Sydney's North Shore. Amazing, isn't it? Amazing, isn't it? So let's have a look at our decision support tool. We've um, designed, um, it's a four sheet, a four separated A4 laminated sheet with a cover sheet that could be, is going to become available. It will sit flat and it's therefore is going to be easily stored and it might be placed in a folder or clipped together. The idea being is that the, the tool can be used as a quick reference resort for nurses during a consultation but also might be used as an educational tool when in consultation um, with a patient. So you can actually physically show the patient um, some pictures and provide some easy backups with some statistics or some um, evidence-based guidelines that you can actually show them quite clearly. The decision support tool is essentially split into four sections. There's contraception, preconception both for males and females, there's pregnancy as a pregnancy algorithm and there's also a resource section at the end. So why plan to have or not have a, have a family? Family planning allows individuals and couples to anticipate and attain their desired number of children and the spacing and timing of their births. It is achieved through the use of contraceptive methods and the treatment of involuntary infertility. A woman's ability to space and limit her pregnancies has a direct impact on her health and well-being, as well as on the outcome of each pregnancy. The benefits of family planning uh, promote better health outcomes for babies, for mothers and babies, reduces poverty, promotes gender equality, promotes health rights and increases education among particularly young women. Um, I'd like, I'd to, like to, to, to say something there. there. I do a lot of clinics for young women and, and um, in the areas where I work, uh, they're, uh, they're very disadvantaged. Um, um, they're often at risk of unplanned pregnancies. They're not staying at school. Uh, and I think it's it's a great opportunity to work with those young women and empower them to make you know different choices in their lives, particularly if they are disadvantaged. Would you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So reproductive health addresses the reproductive processes, functions and systems of all stages of life. 
Reproductive health therefore implies that people are able to have a responsible, satisfying and safe sex life and that they can have the capability to reproduce and the freedom to decide if, when and how often to do so. Implicit in this, in this, in this right for men and women is to be informed of, of um, access of effective, affordable and acceptable methods of fertility regulation of their choice and the right to access appropriate healthcare services that enable women to go through safely for a safe pregnancy and childbirth and provide couples with the best chance of having a healthy infant. So the decision support shields provides an opportunity for nurses to raise the issue in pertaining family planning with their patients, to really get them thinking about timing and spacing of um, pregnancies. To use the use of contraception, lifestyle impacts such as drug use, smoking and obesity, all of these things have a potential on the fertility and also the outcomes of the child. We are, as nurses that work in general practice, we're in such a privileged position to be having these conversations with our patients. And the impact we can make by initiating a conversation as simple as, have you had your flu injection? Um, do you smoke? Are you planning a pregnancy? All of those things mm. have long-term impacts on the health of the pregnant woman and also the potential health mm. of that child when that child is born. Mm. And that's, you know, we're in such a valuable position. That's what we're doing this for. Mm. And, I, and I think too, since um, APNA has become the primary um, healthcare nurses association and it's broadened out that, that you know, it's it's a great tool for primary you know, nurses working in primary healthcare as well. Um, and you know, again, it's really positive that that's happened. Yeah. So the first section we're going to look at is contraception. So in the contraception section, you've got to remember that decision support tool provides an overview of contraception with the aim of improving accurate information on contraceptive methods to women and men seeking contraceptive advice. Remembering also that a contraceptive medical assessment is required by a trained health professional. We're not saying that everybody has to know all the facts about contraception. We're not in a privilege unless um, as a GP or as a nurse practitioner to be able to provide um, um, a prescription for contraceptive devices. But what we're saying is this tool hopefully is going to open up the doors that you can actually engage a patient with some ideas about some contraception options that might suit that patient. They may have no ideas about the different alternatives of what's available on the market. And as nurses working in general practice, why can't we have those conversations with a patient? The tool will take them through very simply and show them the pros and cons of certain forms of contraception. Just looking at the slide now, you can see we've broken it down into sort of five sections. The first one being a long-acting reversible contraception. We're also looking at other forms of hormonal methods, barrier methods, fertility awareness and sterilization. And with each of those sections, we've gone through um, quite clearly. I'll just show you the next slide, which is looking at the long-acting reversible contraception. Not necessarily this particular one, but the idea being is that it, there's, there's nice bright pictures. It's clear. Some people have no idea what the device looks like. If you talk about an implant onto some people, they've got, they've got this imagining in their head that it's mm. this huge, a, a huge um, device or something, a marine is huge, and where, mm. where's that possibly mm. going to go? And people have no idea about what the devices look like. The idea with the decision support tool is that we've clearly showed the pictures We've talked about the pros and cons very simply of those forms of contraception, the disadvantages, the advantages, and also the efficacy. So people really don't understand the, about efficacy, about how effective a form of birth control is. And hopefully the decision support tool will actually very simply go through with some simple statistics that then may lead the, um, both the nurse and the, the um, client in consultation to look further into some further resources through family planning or Mary Stokes or Andrology Australia, looking at different forms and finding further information. Mm -hmm. I think, I think nurses are, are in an ideal position to be able to do that because they've got a little bit of extra time as well. Um, and then, you know, maybe working in consultation with the doctor, particularly in general practice. So that's why it's such yeah. a resource because it's a really go-to guide. It's the start of the conversations in the day that that's what we're saying. This is actually going to open the doors for lots of nurses to actually get the information, feel comfortable to have a conversation with someone and really get them thinking. And it doesn't, you know, 
they don't have to take the consultation to the end. They may not be they may not be in their scope of practice to be able to take it any further, but they will then be able to engage another member of staff within their, their own particular practice, or maybe refer them to family planning or other um, resources that they can use. We're just now going to um, show you a YouTube clip. This is a form of sterilization. It's a form of um, birth control called a SUR, and it's a um, it's a, um, a permanent form of female sterilization. We're just going to show you the YouTube clip now. Assure is a permanent birth control procedure that works with the body to create a natural barrier against pregnancy. During this gentle procedure, an Assure certified doctor places soft, flexible micro inserts into the fallopian tubes. No incision is needed because these tiny inserts are delivered through the vagina and cervix. The micro inserts do not contain hormones and are made with materials that have been used in medical devices for years. Over the next several weeks, a natural barrier forms around the micro inserts that prevent sperm from reaching the eggs. After three months, it's time to get an Assure confirmation test to verify you're protected from unplanned pregnancy. During this gentle test, a doctor, usually a radiologist, introduces a special dye into the uterus that shows up on x-rays. This allows the doctor to confirm that the tubes are blocked and you can rely on Assure for birth control. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll come, just in come in there. Um, the other name, um, the other name for Eshore is Conceptus, um, and, and, um, and it's been around, been around for probably about for about 10, 10 to 12, 10 to 12 years, years now. It's available, it's available um, through uh, most sort of gynae at clinics at, at the local public hospitals do um, have Eshore. Um, private hospitals are a little bit more expensive, but if the woman goes through the gynae clinic, then it um, is covered by Medicare. And as you can see, it's an alternative to um, the other sterilization process of uh, tubal ligation, probably less side effects because there's not a general anaesthetic that's involved with it. So um, we thought we put that clip in just to give you a little bit of information about, you know, for some who, who don't know about Eshore and um, that it is a, absolutely another option and another choice for women. So we're just going to do another poll now. So how do you usually discuss contraception with your patients? Would it be opportunistically, during a planned consultation, or never? And it's interesting the statistics have got so far opportunistically. So if that's a really important component, the very fact that people yeah. are actually engaging their people and engaging their patients in conversations mm. regarding um, contraception, which is huge. Yes, yes. Um, yes. So, yeah. mm. well done. Well done. So I'd just like to go back to um, the long-acting reversible contraception because I know we've actually had a few questions about yeah, that. Um, so just to clarify, what long-acting reversible contraception is, is that it's a form of contraception that um, actually has quite a high efficacy in the fact that it relies less on um, the person that's using it. So basically once it's in place or once it's doing its job, um, such as the an IUD, a marina IUD, can actually stay in place for five years. Um, the implanon um, can actually stay in place for three years. So consequently, if it's in place, it's a form of contraception that requires less effort on the, post, on the part of the person who's actually using that form of contraception. And that's why there's such a good effort. It's a, it's a really effective form of birth control. We're not sort of talking specifically about the long-acting reversible contraception, but we were just sort of focusing on the different forms of contraception, and that's why we focused on that one. So we're just going to move it on now to talk a little bit about preconception care. The decision support tools uh, looks at um, preconception care both for men and women. So the definition of preconception care is any intervention provided to a woman, interesting that it says to a woman, but it's also about men as well, to a woman of childbearing age regardless of her pregnancy status or desire for pregnancy to improve health outcomes for women, newborn and children. So why do we want to provide um, preconception care? So there's lots of uh, research has reported that planned pregnancies have improved outcomes for both the mother and the child. Preconception healthcare and education promotes planned conception, assisting a woman and her partner to identify and manage risk factors in their lives and their environment and be, to be able to identify healthy behaviours 
that promote the well-being of the woman and the potential fetus. So simple things, alcohol, smoking, obesity. Most people do not engage in preconception care, even though it can promote fertility and improve outcomes for mothers and babies. So we're first going to look at the preconception care for women. And maybe some of you have actually got to, you've actually received your um, decision support tool. I think they were mailed out and many of you are hopefully sitting at home holding those and looking at them. So the first picture that we've got is um, the preconception care for women. And we've, it's hopefully just a simple way of, of, um, of looking at it and, and looking at the things, the, the things that you may want to consider discussing with your patients. So the preconception care for women can be used as a way of assisting a consultation when providing advice to a woman or as a simple prompt for the nurse. The wheel includes national recommendations and evidence-based practice that many women may simply not be aware of. That is the, the alcohol intake folic acid supplement. So um, the national guidelines, for example, for alcohol intake is actually no alcohol. Um, so you might have women that may ask you, is it okay for me to have a, have a glass of wine once every so often? Well, the answer is no. That's clearly stated in our, in our guidelines. And that's the message that we need to be telling women um, is to encouraging women before they get pregnant um, to think about stopping taking alcohol because we don't know when they're going to get pregnant. And for women who are pregnant, that you may see, you need to be having that conversation with your patients and hopefully by utilising the decision support tool, you can clearly show them why and then show them the national guidelines. The prompts are easy to follow and further information related to the prompts are located on the flip side of the wheel. So on each part of the information, there's um, the wheel is there and on the other side of the wheel, um, we've actually got information that backs up what we've actually said. We've also included our men, okay, so it's really important that we look after preconception care for men. When talking about preconception care, the focus is often on the women, but as we know it takes two to make a baby and why wouldn't we have that conversation with our male patients as well. Men play an equally important role and the owner should be on the partnership to ensure that both have done as much as possible to prepare and be in the best shape possible to conceive. Preconception care offers an opportunity similar to the opportunity presents for women for disease prevention and health promotion in men. To the end of the, the webinar, we're actually just going to go through a bit of a, um, a, a case study regarding preconception care for men and women. So we'll probably explore that a little bit further on later on in the webinar. The preconception um, care for men, just like we have with women, may be used in joint consultation when, when providing preconception advice for a woman. So maybe if a couple coming together, you can actually have a conversation with both of them about what they both need to be doing to promote fertility. Yep. Um, the prompts simply provide a reminder of the important information required to share with your male patients. And like I said before, the wheel includes national recommendation and evidence-based practice that many men may simply not be aware of. Mm. As, a, as an example, there's a recommendation for men to be immunized against the pertussis immunization. There's also research that shows that we know that obesity in men can actually impact on the fertility, uh, a male's fertility, uh, chances of uh, conception. And, and many men may simply not know that. They just think it's up to, the, to their partner. So for many men, if they're obese, that delay can actually play a significant role in them trying to get pregnant. Mm. Well, I, I think in, in my practice where I work in a women's health centre, it's, it's the woman often coming in to discuss her fertility issues and really not thinking that it could be male factor. And so that's really important to discuss all of that. And some, you know, I've had a, a client who whose partner actually had a torsion of the testes um, and that was actually what was stopping the, the fertility and they were a young couple. Um, so I think it's really important that we've, we've got that in the tool and as well. And also simple yeah. things like Joe said, but it, could be, um, it could be an undiagnosed sexually transmissible infection that the yeah. male may have. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and it may be something that potentially hindering his future potential fertility. And, and as we know, if you don't ask these questions, you're not going to get the answers. So we need to be proactive in asking these particular questions. That's right. Yep. We're just going to ask another poll question, that's okay. Are you aware, we talked about this before, that obesity and age are factors that have the potential to affect a male's fertility? So we've just got a question, that's a really good question. 
Um, the question is, um, can women have a pertussis, immunization, a pertussis immunization in the third trimester? Um, the answer is yes. According to the guidelines now, you can actually give a, a pertussis immunization to women in the third trimester. The only issue is, and it's a, an important component, is the fact that if you do do that, the baby has to have a booster at 18 months. And it's something on a practical level that we do where I work, is that we actually put something in the clinical notes in an action at 18 months. So when that baby's, when the person comes back with that newborn baby, we actually add something into the action so that when that child is 18 months, they actually have to have a booster of, of, of pertussis. And that's not funded at the moment by the government. And it's something that people need to be aware of. So if they do get the whooping cough immunization in the third trimester, there's a booster required for the baby. So that's a really good question. Thank you. And then there's another and couple, there's of, another couple of, there of questions there around, there around um, immunization. Yep. So does the baby still have to have normal immunizations at six weeks, four months yes. and six months? Yes. Absolutely. But just the schedule doesn't change for the baby. So if the mother's immunized against whooping cough at, um, in the third trimester, which we said before, like I said, is safe, it doesn't change anything the baby. So six weeks, four months and six months, the baby still has to have the, um, hoop, um, the immunizations according to the schedule. But at their 18-month immunizations, when they get the combined varicella, and the measles, mumps, rubella immunisation, they also have to have an extra um, DTPA injection. So why is the booster required for the baby at 18 months? I think it's to do with the serology, just because the woman's been immunised and to the, the crossover with the placenta. And, um, and so even though it's, it, it's perfectly safe to do, it's just that the, um, the the status of the child might not be effective at 18 months, and that's why that boost is required. And why for men? There's a question about why we give um, pertussis immunizations to men. If you think about immunizing, um, we talk about herd immunity by looking after the child by protecting the herd. The idea being is that if you actually immunize the men before the, the baby's born, and the National Health and Medical Research Council guidelines this year stipulate that they want it done at least two weeks before that baby's born. So you're talking a distance, um, you're talking if, if, a, if anyone's holding a baby, anyone that comes within arm's length of a baby is potentially at risk of spreading pertussis. And so it's really about caregivers. And I guess on a, on a, on a honest level, if you think about immunizing, you shouldn't just be having a conversation with um, the, the mums and the dads, but realistic, realistically, anybody who's coming into contact with that baby, you might want to think about encouraging them to get the pertussis immunisation. Um, there's a question about where did you get the information from, the booster information from. Um, I, I work in uh, Hunter New England Health and we've got a really proactive population. Yeah, we can we can we can follow up that. Um, there's a lot of support from population health departments regarding information, um, but we can follow that up through APNA. Yeah. There's a question: Is we usually do a blood group and resuscitate? Yeah, 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 answered that one. <laughs> we'll continue on. <laughs> So we just like to um, a little bit of a. There's actually it's quite an interesting time that we're having. Um, there's a fertility week that's actually coming up on the first, um, the first to seventh of September this year. And um, your fertility is a project which is funded by the Commonwealth Department of Health and Victorian Department of Health. And um, it's really about promoting um, timing of pregnancies. And, and maybe, maybe this is the perfect time to have this start having this conversation with your patients. Maybe the fact that Fertility Week is coming up, the 1st to 7th of September, we can actually be engaging our patients, a perfect time to be having these conversations with our patients. So some interesting statistics to consider. It is estimated that about one in 20 males are infertile, and one in eight Australian couples are infertile, and male infertility is the sole cause in approximately 20% of infertile couples. And causes of male infertility include poor sperm production as a, result, as a result of an STI, such as chlamydia and gonorrhea, testicular damage, like Joe was saying before, 
from infection, including mumps from non-immunised males, as well as smoking, drug use and obesity. And that's a really important component. Again, if you're having a conversation with a, with a young man who's not immunised against mumps, you, the potential that if that young man contracts mumps and it potentially could affect his fertility to then going on to make him infertile. So again, to be proactive, to be promoting that as nurses in primary health care, that's one of our huge roles is to promote that. That's what we need to be doing. And that's again why we're promoting this decision support tool. So remembering that there are many causes of infertility that may be preventable, manageable and treatable and that's what we need to be doing. It's just a quite a quirky slide that talks about um, timing of sex. So, um, you know, often, and Joe and I were talking about this before, you'll get patients that come in and, and they may have been experiencing problems and they've not been, um, you know, they've been trying for a few months to get pregnant. And, and you start talking to them about, you know, how often they're sexually active and their partner might work away for three weeks mm -hmm. out of the month mm -hmm. and they come home for a month and the first four days, you know, the partner might be absolutely exhausted and they're not sexually active and it's like, well, you can't make a baby unless you're sexually active. That's right. So it's a conversation to be had with your patients because a lot of people, you know, they're trying all the, they're doing all the right things and hopefully trying to look after themselves and not smoking and eating well and exercising and everything, but if they're not sexually active, they're not going to be making a baby. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Some further statistics to consider regarding unintended pregnancy. So Australia has one of the highest rates of unplanned pregnancy in the Western countries, with an estimated one in two pregnancies being unplanned or mistimed, and one in three pregnancies ending in, a, in induced abortion. Quite sobering statistics, I think, for the Western country that we live in. So we've also, as part of our decision support tool, included a pregnancy algorithm and I'd like to think of it as a bit of a go-to guide. Uh, on a practical level, you know, the number of people that I see who have um, an unintended but wanted pregnancy, who've got no idea where to go to next. They don't know what what they need to do. So it's just a simple way of saying, um, you know, maybe you need to start having some blood tests or this is what happens. Or they don't know what referral options are available to them, who's going to care for them in their pregnancy. And the algorithm shows us, you know, there's options within the public system, a GP shared care option or a private obstetrician. And it's stuff like that that people just really don't know. And for women who find themselves in an unintended pregnancy where they're really unsure about their options that are available to them, we've actually included some um, resources that are available in the community. And there's a really good uh, resource that's available for women to access. And it's a phone number. It's government supported. And they can also put you in touch with um, other services that can actually support you during a decision-making process. There's also funding available um, through um, Medicare, so you can have access to a mental health nurse who's able to provide pregnancy counselling um, and other um, allied health professionals that can provide that counselling. So just to let people know that there are services available that can support um, women who find themselves in a dilemma as to what they, what they do with an unintended mm -hmm. pregnancy. And that, there are, and that there are those support services out there, services out there so that you're not feeling, so, as you were, as a clinician, that you're having to do everything on your own. You, you've got some backup there. So some of the benefits of the pregnancy algorithm, um, just talking about it's easy to follow. It provides the often, often forgotten option about um, fostering or adoption. And it provides pregnancy options with some examples of who might be in a position to provide support during this time. Just a few questions, just a few questions that have come through, that have come through and, and um, Tina has, has, has made a comment that she can't see answers. We've, we've been sort of answering questions around um, preconception, immunisation. Is that going to be made available? Yep. yep, so we've, we've, we've sorted, sorted it out. Okay. Okay. All right, All right. So, um, we'll so we'll keep answering, answering the questions as we go along. Okay. okay. The decision support tool has also a resource section at the end with clinical practice guidelines and other helpful resource um, sites and resources. And I guess that the um, when you're actually having a conversation with any of your clients regarding this type of information. We're not saying that you, you're not going to be in a position to provide all the information, but it's a starting point. 
and it's a point where then you can actually access further information together in consultation or maybe you can advise that they might be able to do some research on their own for some reputable websites and information um, such as Andrology Australia and Family Planning, Mari Stopes, um, all of those types of resources that will provide knowledgeable evidence-based advice um, to your patients. So Absolutely. that's what we're saying and that's why it's a really good resource section. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, so I see a lot of um, clients probably from 14 to 50 who are looking at um, contraception and wanting advice around contraception and uh, I guess over the years I've, I've worked for family planning for many years and then I got involved in women's health and became a nurse practitioner. I think for me it's about um, having a conversation and as I said, I, I only see women, but there are times when men, when male partners come in with with the woman as well. It's about facilitating a choice <clears throat> and and getting a sense of where that woman's at, whether she wants to have children in the future, what what her plans might be. Um, there is a um, family planning produces a great resource around contraception, which has the World Health Organization eligibility criteria, and that's a really helpful one if you're looking at you know um, women with disease processes like mental health, migraine with aura, head, um, other types of headache, uh, family history of thromboembolism or an actual um, history, personal history of um, thromboembolism or breast cancer, you can actually work through and work out what might be the best and most suitable method for that woman. Um, but also as Ruth has alluded to, including things like preconception advice, opportunities like if you are seeing someone who wants to go on the pill for example so having that chat and talking about maybe doing some preconception screening um, and also certainly some um, opportunistic chlamydia screening if, if that is appropriate in that in that um, with that client um, so I, I was just going to talk a little bit about um, a case study and you know it's just one of many and you've probably come across young women um, like Christine um, yourselves um, but Christine Christine came to see me. She's a 24-year-old Aboriginal woman, and she has a she's a sole parent, but she she does have a regular partner, and um, she has a, a toddler who's two and a half. She's not really wanting to have any more children, probably for about five years, and um, she's actually involved with Brighter Futures because she's had some struggles with her parenting, and was referred by the Brighter Futures worker. So initially, her history suggests that she does have migraine with aura, and that she had actually um, commenced the oral contraceptive pill at some point in her life but had started to have those headaches where you do get the blurred vision, the pins and needles, you get that prodromal sort of um, feeling that, that you get going to get a headache and I mean those who have migraines definitely know that they get migraines. Um, and so the pill is actually a contraindication for a woman who does have migraine with aura. So what we, we talked about, we actually sort of really talked a lot about different methods. She didn't want to use a barrier method um, and really she was looking at having some long-term contraception. So I talked to her both about Implanon um, and the Mirena IUD and she decided initially to go with um, Implanon. Um, and I think with, with Implanon, we'll show you, we'll show you um, the insertion procedure shortly, I think it's really important that your counselling um, talks a lot about um, the bleeding pattern on Implanon because a lot of um, women will actually stop the device because you know of nuisance bleeding that actually might settle down after say three to six months um, and I mean some women have no periods and some women will have a period every month and that's something that we just cannot predict but the counselling really does help with that and the counselling helps with the other side effects that someone asked before of the typical progesterone side effects of um, mood swings, headaches and breast tenderness and sometimes some acne. But as I said, not all women will get those. Um, so we tried Christine with um, an implant on and um, she returned back to me 
just sort of about seven to eight months down the track, she was experiencing some quite, um, you know, bizarre mood swings. Her bleeding pattern was quite normal, but it was the mood swings that actually brought her back to see me because it was interfering with her relationship. Um, and so I um, talked further about what she'd like to do, and she ended up having a Mirena. Um, we, we talked about Mirena, and she ended up having the Mirena put in. And um, so, so far, that's been in now for about sort of six to eight weeks. She's come back to see me for um, a checkup post insertion, and that seems to be going well. Um, and I, I removed her implant on. She said that the, the mood swings did settle down, but certainly, of course, you can get mood swings on Mirena as well. So at this point, we're keeping an eye on it. But I, I guess with mood swings, it's really hard to know whether it's caused by something that's going on in our life or whether it's actually the contraception. Um, but you know, she was looking for a long-acting reversible contraceptive method, and I think that you know, hopefully, she'll be happy with the Mirena. Um, and you know, again, if you're sort of looking for resources, I think if you're working in your your own practice or in primary healthcare, find out where you can refer your clients to, because not not all, in my experience, not all general practices are actually doing um, implanon or Mirena insertions. Family planning again is a really good service um, that that does both of those, but also women's health centres. Family planning has a great in New South Wales has a um, talk line. Um, where they will provide you with information about who, where to go, what, what referral pathways might be the best. So I think we'll, we'll go on and I'll show you this um, Implanon um, clip. And I, I think what we're doing with Implanon now um, is we're trying to actually train nurses with um, the drug companies actually trying to do some training with nurses to actually be able to insert and remove. Um, and I, I think that that sort of allows for the opportunity to do it for, from a client perspective as well because you know sometimes that there are barriers in accessing contraception so with nurses doing um, these procedures it actually does able to break down some barriers around that <coughs> So, so you might have actually um, had a look at this. This is a, a YouTube, um, uh, you know, a presentation. Uh, I, I often had referred to it when I first started inserting um, Implanon. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm lucky because I can do the consultation and the prescription. So, um, the the woman we put the the device in the non-dominant arm uh, with some local anaesthetic. It's measured from the bone. Um, Oh, I can't remember the, the name of that, that bone, but it is the second one closer to sort of the, the, the main part of the, the, um, forearm, oh, the, the forearm, and eight centimetres up from that. Um, you can see that the local anaesthetic is going in. I actually think that's the hardest part for the woman, is the local anaesthetic. It does sting. Um, and also I think nurses, as nurses, we're notoriously not, not taught to put local in, so I think that's, that was difficult for me. I had to learn all of that. The device itself is quite easy to, to put in, so you can see it's like a bit of a staple gun. So it's just a matter of inserting um, the device and lifting it up so that it actually goes just under the skin. So you can see that as, as um, this practitioner is actually doing that. Um, sliding the needle to its full length, so you need to make sure that that, that needle has gone in completely. And then, can you see the blue um, knob up the top? The, the practitioner will actually pull that knob down, and that will enable the device to actually just sit in under the skin. And that's the procedure done. So then the woman will be left with a very small incision, and um, I usually just put some steri strips over the top of it and get the woman to actually feel to make sure that she can actually feel that rod as well. Because what we know is that when it's in, um, it, it's working and it will change the bleeding pattern of, of that woman. Um, a pressure bandage goes on and it's on for a couple of days, just because there will be some bruising for the woman for up to seven days. Now, normally we like to put it in um, day one to five of the woman's cycle, but there is evidence um, from the family planning handbook around a, a process called quick start, and you know that's something that you know you might want to familiarise yourself with. Okay. Okay. So, so then um, we'll move we'll move on um, and um, continue on.
Hi, so I'd like to take you through a bit of a case study and or, uh, regarding preconception care. We're just going to talk about Tammy and Tammy's uh, a young lady that I met probably um, March, April this year, 2014 and um, Tammy actually presented as a 29-year-old lady who came in for the removal of an implanon. And the reason that she was having the implanon removed was because um, she was hoping to um, try for a baby. And her and her partner were actually going um, to somewhere in far north Queensland for a holiday and going for a, a wedding and also having their honeymoon. And she was actually hoping to, to start trying for a baby while they were there. And we saw this as a perfect opportunity to provide some um, preconception care. So once she'd actually had the implant on removed, we sat down for a few minutes and just went through a few things. It, as it was, um, Tammy presented later, we went through a few more details, but it just gave us as a perfect opportunity, probably an, opportunist, uh, an opportunistic opportunity to discuss some preconception care with Tammy. She came on her own. She didn't come with a partner. Um, and we actually did discuss a couple of things that her partner might have wanted to think about too. So one of the first things I simply spoke to her about was, to, um, was simply about immunisations to protect against um, some vaccine preventable immunisations such as um, um, the flu injection. And as Tammy was, you know, we were entering into the flu season, this was a perfect opportunity for her really to consider the flu injection. It's actually recommended in pregnancy and considering that she was actually planning a pregnancy, then why not do this before that? And the other thing that we also spoke about was the immunisation against um, whooping cough, which is the Boostrix immunisation, which the National Health and Medical Research Council, as you know, recommended. And it's a perfect opportunity before pregnancy to even sort of consider actually having that done too. So while she was there opportunistically, we did manage to get her flu injection, also a Boostrix immunisation into her before she actually went um, on a honeymoon, which was a perfect opportunity to do that too. And of course that gave us a perfect opportunity to discuss that also her partner would really consider having that whooping cough immunisation. Um, ideally before that baby was born the National Health and Medical Research Council talk about having the immunisation at least three weeks before that baby's born so why not before he was going on holiday of course it also protects against tetanus as well and his tetanus immunisation might have been a bit low so that was again um, an ideal opportunity to discuss those things with her for both herself and also her partner. Um, Tammy had no idea about the iodine of folic acid recommendations, so we did speak about that. And I said to her, you know, that it wasn't a big deal. She could simply get a pre-pregnancy multivitamin from the chemist that had the recommendations, the recommended dose of both iodine and folic acid in a pre-pregnancy vitamin, the idea being to start, to start taking it now. And that could take her through to the birth of her baby and also if she considered breastfeeding afterwards um, to continue the, um, the iodine and the folic acid um, as supplements into her breastfeeding period as well. While we were talking about medications, um, you know, Tammy had been a patient of ours for quite some time, so she actually doesn't have any past history of anything of any concern. There was no family history of anything, epilepsy, diabetes, or that type of thing. So I know that Tammy wasn't taking any medica medications, but while she was there, I thought it was an opportunistic time just to simply ask her that did she take any over-the-counter medications and just to advise her, just to be mindful of the fact that over-the-counter medications, there are some that you probably would not want to take um, with in a pre-pregnancy period and also a pregnancy because you really don't know in the pre-pregnancy period as to when she was going to fall pregnant. And um, so even just simple over-the-counter medications, cold and flu type preparations are something that you'd kind of want to avoid in a pregnancy. So I just advised her that, you know, if she was pregnant that and then she needed to see, um, needed to buy something from the chemist, a medication that she was interested in buying, to actually speak to the pharmacist and make sure that she spoke to the pharmacist to ensure that that medication medication was safe um, during the pregnancy. So as Tammy and her soon-to-be husband were running off on a lovely holiday, we spoke about alcohol and, uh, and about the recommendations for no alcohol. I think a lot of women are really unsure about the fact that, um, and men, that um, alcohol and pregnancy just certainly doesn't mix. And also in the preconception period, because we don't know when she's going to conceive, my advice to Tammy was really not, no alcohol at all. Um, and while we were talking about that, again, it was an opportunistic time to, to encourage her with her partner too, because as we know, alcohol um, in excessive amounts can actually affect the, the, the sperm health as well. And considering that they were actually planning a pregnancy, that was a really important um, factor for both her in the fact that they wanted her not to drink any alcohol, but also with her partner as well. 
Tammy was a non-smoker, but actually her partner was a smoker of about 25 cigarettes a day. So that was a conversation that we had about um, obviously just the general um, good health of, of not smoking for him and to really encourage him to really consider that smoking. And also the fact that we know that, um, that smoking potentially has the effect of, um, uh, can affect the DNA of the sperm. Um, so that, you know, that was something to be really mindful of. And she really wasn't aware of that. She thought that the smoking issue and also the alcohol issue was really related just to the women. And I sort of spoke to her and said, no, that, that this has the potential to affect the um, fertility both for you and your partner. So we spoke at length of that too. So Tammy was quite a keen exerciser. She liked to go for a walk every day and she was quite keen on swimming and kind of keen to go to the gym. And, and I said, and she was fearful that she was going to be doing the wrong thing by doing her exercise. And I encourage her, you know, the recommendation is to continue with the exercise. Of, of course, to be mindful of the fact that her body shape is going to be changing through the pregnancy period and to be mindful of, um, you know, um, her change of shape and the fact that she might become almost a little bit clumsy with some of her exercises to so, so to speak to her to the gym person that she was seeing and to be maybe have some tailor-made exercises that were maybe were not advisable during the pregnancy period but to certainly with walking and swimming and to continue with that also for her mental health component that was a key um, a key thing for Tammy that she really loved to do that in her life and to actually really encourage her to continue doing her exercise as best she could. And obviously the psychosocial health, to look at her, she was a happy young woman looking forward to, to getting married. Um, she was well supported by her family. And to be mindful of the fact that obviously in um, planning a pregnancy and having a young child, her life is going to significantly change and she's going to need that social community network of people supporting her. And, and just to, you know, to, to talk to her about the fact that to look after her mental health by making that sure she keeps social connections with people, that that exercise is paramount and um, having some special times with her partner and friends and really looking after her mental health as well. Um, we, as Tammy was going on holiday and probably eating foods that maybe she wouldn't eat we, on a normal day, daily basis, we did speak about that, about um, healthy environment, about foods that maybe she would want to start avoiding. Um, there's a really good resource that you can get um, through... Um, New South Wales, not New South Wales Health, um, it's a, a recommendation about food safety and it talks about um, listeria, things like pates and soft cheeses. A lot of people really don't know that soft cheeses are not recommended um, in a pregnancy um, and also pates, um, deli meats and seafood are to be avoided. So the book that I often share with patients, and I actually get, gave one to her, was one from New South Wales Foods Authority, and you can actually download the book. It's a really good resource to have, and it talks very simply and clear. Um, it's colour-coded as to the foods that are, that are safe to eat and the foods that should be avoided. And when I said cheeses, things like common-day cheeses such as brie, camembert, ricotta, feta, blue cheeses are ones that really should be avoided um, during a pregnancy. And of course, because she's planning a pregnancy to avoid those foods, foods too. And soft-serve ice creams, it's okay to have hard ice cream that's scooped out of a container, but the soft-serve ice creams, the ones you get um, from the machines, they're to be avoided. So common foods that you might might not be aware of just to sort of um, bring that to the fore and to just to make sure that she is aware of those things that need to be avoided. Cam, uh, Tammy actually has a cat and, and not that, you know, she, no one's saying that she needs to get rid of the cat, but that's actually something we have to be careful with toxoplasmosis. And we spoke about that, about making sure that, um, that she didn't actually physically handle the cat litter. The cat was an inside cat and had cat litter inside it actually in the laundry. And I said to her that it's something that she really needs to avoid touching the cat litter and get her partner to do that. And also gardening, as cats obviously go, um, you know, um, often use the, the gardens to poo and stuff like that just to make sure that if she was gardening that she made sure she put um, gardening gloves on just to protect herself from that too in the, in the outside. So we did speak about all of those things. I gave her a booklet and, and, and sort of advised to be mindful of those things that, she, that could cause, um, potentially cause um, some problems to an unborn baby. 
Um, we had a bit of an overview about her general health because she was a regular patient in the practice. We knew that, you know, her pap smears up to date and all of those types of things. Um, but we did run through that and also re reiterated the family history. Like I said, there was no genetic family history of anything, but it was something to be mindful of. If there was anything that genetic, it might be important to, to refer to some specialists in order to have some um, genetic testing if that was required. In Tammy's case and her partner, that wasn't an issue. As Tammy was 29 uh, and her partner was 35, we did speak about sort of the reproductive life plan, about considering the number and spacing and timing of children desired. Her partner being 35, um, she really wasn't aware of the fact that age for men is also a consideration in fertility and the fact that um, it wasn't just her age but it was also her partner's age and um, you know of, of course if they only wanted a couple of children but if they wanted sort of three or four children her being 29 he being 35 that um, they really you know were looking at, at really starting that family now and um, and if they did want to have a few children really seriously thinking about how they were going to space that and again just bringing that to the fore or bringing, may, maybe making her think about the fact that would it change her career path in a way and, or maybe put something on hold if they did want to start having a number of children. Um, ideally, it's a good time. This is a perfect time to discuss all of those things with her. With her. And ideally, it would be nice to speak to her partner. But again, it wasn't an opportunity at that time because she came for the removal of the implant. But again, it gave us a few things to discuss, both that were relevant for her, but also with her partner. And, um, and hopefully, we brought some things that um, and discussed a couple of issues that might be kind of significant in her pre-pregnancy planning with that baby. That's the end. So I think we're going to ask answer some questions. So just bear with us because there's a, a million of them. So uh, we'll just try and run through. Well, we've we've sort of answered some of the questions, but I think towards yeah we can certainly elaborate on those. Um, and um, I think that there's been some questions around both preconception and contraception. Um, and also, I think that you know Karen down the bottom has written something about you know the the male factor issues in pregnancy. I think, as you said, yeah. Ruth, that's really important, isn't it? And um, you know, really, really, we're not just considering the female in this case. Um, I answered a question a little bit back for uh, Wei, who asked about antidepressants during preconception. And I sort of spoke about, because I, I work in Sydney, um, there is um, a service called Mother Safe, which is at the Royal Hospital for Women. And that is a wonderful service for both um, clients clients and health professionals where you can actually ring, ring in, um, get advice about drugs in pregnancy, um, around you know whether, whether yes, anti, antidepressants are safe for use, I mean some, some certainly are not, um, but you know you'd have to tailor that to your individual um, client and then you know just make a phone call and you'd get some information and I'm certain that in other states there would be a similar service at you know you, you, the local um, like Melbourne Women's Health um, Hospital in Melbourne there would be something like that as well. Or and I think that's Australia a really important well. um, point about medications um, in pre-pregnancy. So that's the type of thing that if we're engaging with women who are considering a pregnancy, if they have um, a chronic disease and they're actually prescribed anti-epileptic medications or cardiovascular medications or if they're on antidepressants, are those medications safe during a pregnancy? And those women may not um, may not be aware that potentially though the medications they may be on may not be conducive to a pregnancy. So it's a case of actually having that conversation with those women to say, you need to speak to your consultant or your GP about these types of medications. Are these medications okay if you're planning a pregnancy? And it may be that they need to be tailor-made. They need to tailor and um, prescribe something or change it or adjust it. But again, if you engage those women and have that conversation before they get pregnant, then they're they're meeting the best possible outcomes by having um, their chronic disease managed safety and safely and effectively, but also mm -hmm. going into a pregnancy with medic with medications that are safe for an unborn child. Yeah. Mm. Um, so Nari um, and I had had a little bit of a conversation here around um, management of nuisance bleeding and I was uh, sort of making the comments around, you know, maybe we, we really don't know what's going to work 
for an individual woman, but often I would try her with um, a combined oral contraceptive pill for about four months to see if that actually settles the yep, bleeding yep, down. Yep, yep, would yep. you sort of go with the pill first, Ruth? Yep. Um, but I also spoke about, I mean, certainly if she's got contraindications to the pill, then we'd need to look at something else. But I did also speak about um, a drug called tranexamic acid, um, and I, I think it's it's something that is actually underutilised. We can use it a lot with women who have um, heavy menstrual bleeding who, you know, maybe in their 40s and they've got, got, you know, fibroid but they're getting really heavy periods. It's a drug that can be taken for probably the first three to four days of a cycle. Um, and it's actually, its other name is cyclocaprin uh, and it's an antifibrinolytic. Um, and so what it's actually do doing hopefully is actually slowing down the bleeding um, and, you know, maybe creating some clotting for, for the woman but certainly, I mean, you'd need to look at the um, consumer medicines information sheet to sort of look at whether, you know, whether that woman is suitable um, for tranexamic acid. I mean, someone who's taking um, warfarin, for example, wouldn't be. Um, so it, it is a really good drug and it does work quite well. Uh, and I think that, you know, in, in all of the implanon insertions that I've done, um, probably um, nuisance bleeding is an issue, um, but it's been more of an issue from, for women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds um, who, uh, you know, if they're getting some spotting that's going on, then they're not able to actually have sex with their partner. And so that's created the problem there. Um, but having said that, a lot of my clients recently have been from African countries where I think that, you know, larks are quite a normal, you know, contraceptive um, option and, um, you know, those women really are fine to tolerate most things, <laughs> most of the side effects that they may or may not get. But I think they do, you know, certainly tolerate them um, really well. Just on that again, so Judith asks a question about doc uh, how do the doctors feel about nurses doing insertions. Uh, I'm just really fortunate to work with um, a, a wonderful GP who, you know, taught, has taught me an awful lot, um, but I've actually had the opportunity to, to teach her recently how to remove them on her own, so I think she was really grateful for me to, to do that for her. Um, look, I, I think it is an issue. I know that Monash University is currently doing some um, initial research into, um, you know, whether nurses working in, uh, general, in general practice and, you know, what you know, how that might be for, for those nurses. I, I think it would be great, but I guess it's about, you know, having that interaction with the GP that you're working with and certainly I guess that there would be some GPs who are a little bit territorial and averse to, to, you know, having nurses do procedures. But, you know, I think that we are actually, what we're doing is providing access and equity to our clients. We're providing another choice for those, for those women as well and, uh, you know, an opportunity for those women to get some really Absolutely. good effective contraception. There's some mm -hmm. good things so, coming through. There's yeah, a yep. comment about preconceptions should also <coughs> include oral health, absolutely, and that's something that we did mention in there. So I think we wrote yeah. something about it's a good time to get a, a, a checkup. So if, if a woman's planning a pregnancy or is pregnant, <laughs> it's probably a good time to have a, a visit to your dentist. And also STI screening, absolutely. So for women who are um, thinking about pregnancy, it's an important uh, question to ask about them, about um, about safe sex practices and really engaging them and asking those particular questions because they may have an undiagnosed sexually transmissible infection which may be untreated and so much so that it could actually potentially affect their fertility, both males and females. So that, that's a key component. Again, that's in the decision support tool and something that you really need to be asking your patients. And again, if you don't ask the questions, you're not going to get the mm -hmm. answers. So you, you know, for some people, it, it, you know, you need to be a little bit brave sometimes asking some of these curly questions, but it's an important component and certainly important questions that need to be asked. I might just answer Matthew's questions, but question, but there's also another one from Angela about vasectomy, so I guess we're sort of looking at, at, at both of those. But um, Matthew, yes, there are a lot of um, same-sex couples having babies and um, I used to work at Leichhardt Women's Health Centre in Sydney and I ran preconception evenings initially and, and it was all about trying to get heterosexual couples to come in and get some really good information and this was probably about 15, 20 years ago. 
Um, and what I got the first evening, I, I you know, advertised and I got 80 people turning up and probably um, two thirds of those were, were women who, um, who were in same sex um, relationships. And so what I then did was um, formulated, uh, you know, um, women coming in to see me for preconception advice. And so part of that was what we've talked about, but a lot of it also was about talking about legal issues, um, which we probably don't have time to go into today, but happy to, to talk to anybody about that. Um, the law, um, mental health, um, screening, um, contracts with donors, how to do it, whether it's via a clinic, IVF clinic or whether it's a known donor, um, you know, um, arrangement. So, so there was all of that, and and I think that that was just a way of, you know, provide again providing information and informed choice because really that's as nurses that's that's what we're on about. Um, and for Angela, uh, there isn't a comment about the length of time about vasectomy. I guess that's about the fact that we couldn't put everything on 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 the sheets. But um, there is a very good. Um, fact sheet that Family Planning New South Wales puts out and also I would imagine that Andrology Australia would have information. Um, we would normally recommend um, a sperm count after three months after the vasectomy or what we used to say at Family Planning was after 18 to 20 ejaculations, whatever came first. So <laughs> if that puts a smile on your face, that's a good thing. There's a really good question so hopefully here that answers Jean your question. that asks about can a father who smokes affect the baby's birth weight? I'm not sure about the baby's birth weight, but we know that cigarette, um, can, that, that smoking can affect the DNA of the sperm and consequently can actually affect the, um, the health of that unborn baby. So that's why it's particularly important that men don't smoke um, and particularly don't smoke um, during, during that time, during preconception, during pregnancy and during the life of that baby because it can affect um, the DNA of the sperm. So it's a really important question. Um, there's another one there about billing for um, the implanon. Um, I just saw that one. Uh, yeah, so there's no item numbers for sorry. nurse practitioners um, to um, to no. bill for an insertion of a um, for an implanon. There is a number that you can use, but it's a ge generic number. But if nurses are going to be upskilled into okay. implanon insertions, we're not there yet, so I'm not quite sure how it's all going to. Um, mm. No, um, but I do agree with Jennifer. I, I think that we need to be part of the consult too, and I think that's where, if you're doing, you know, the the pre sort of counselling around, um, for example, implanon, then you are actually part of that process because you're really providing really good information to that woman so that she can make an informed choice. Um, for Alicia, her primary health care nurse bill, if you're not a nurse practitioner, um, well, I'm, I'm not certain what context of work you're doing, Alicia. I guess if you're um, employed, a lot, of the, a lot of midwives are now inserting implanon and they're employed by, by health, various health departments. Um, I can only claim a time-based um, item for my insertions. I actually can't claim the item numbers for insertion removals that the GPs do. I guess if you're working in general practice, how it might work is that the GP, you know, puts their head in and sees sees the woman. You know, would that yeah. would that be I'm worth doing sure. Ruth, yeah. before insertion? I and I mean, these are all the things that that I think you know, need to be nutted out before it sort of happens. Um, but you know, certainly There's there are ways and means What about substance it? use disorder yeah. in pregnancy? <laughs> I guess that's another question that we need to, um, something that we're engaging people and asking questions about drug use and alcohol intake before pregnancy that if there is an issue that certainly that they can actually, you might be able to put them on the right pathway to seek some support. Um, to actually help with that and get them into the right um, care facility that actually can look after them, um, at, whether it's at the local hospital. Um, but again, if, if you don't ask, you don't know, and that's the types of things that we need to be finding out so that we can mm. actually guess the, get the best outcomes for that pregnancy and that, um, and that baby. Mm. Yeah. Um, for Catherine, um, the online resources, uh, if you have a look at the Inner City Legal Centre, um,
and again, it's New South Wales based, but the, of course you could access it from anywhere. Um, we did a resource a few years back called Talking Turkey, because I guess people sort of looked at donor, donor insemination as using a turkey baster, which is probably the biggest myth out there, um, but that's what they called the resource. So if you have a look at that resource, then there are, um, you know, there is information there around the legalities and contracts and, and that sort of thing. But what I would normally talk to um, couples about would be to actually go and you know go to a legal centre or see a lawyer and get some legal information because as nurses we're not trained to provide that level of, There's a of good legal question support. question here from Mandy: Would you consider appropriate to have preconception talk with both parents together? I guess it depends on what they come in for. The couple that I alluded to um, that came in um, because they were having the, the lady was having the implant on. Um, removed. They were quite happy to engage in that conversation together and sometimes it can just be a, an opportunistic conversation with mm. a guy that comes in and they're going on holiday and you know why, why are you here today? I'm here because we're going on a holiday to Bali and you know we're thinking about having a baby, those types of things and, and I would encourage either them to, mm. either to come back as a couple or to come back on his own and, and I think um, mm. you can judge your, your clients on your own basis and I, I think it would be appropriate if they're happy to have that conversation together and if they're not happy to have that conversation mm. to actually have it separately. The other thing that I would encourage you to do, and I know it's something that, that when I've worked at family planning but also within my own general practice that we've done, we've actually made um, folders up and we've actually included some really good resources within the folder. And I think as um, a, a pregnancy, you know, a woman that comes in with a pregnant, planning a pregnancy or a woman that is pregnant, it's almost like a going home with, a, with some information and um, you know some of the reps have brought things in for us. Um, I, we include the, the food safety book. We include, there's a really good resource from family planning about preconception. Um, some of the reps have brought mm. us um, some iodine and folic acid supplements. You know, th just those types of things, so just some information. Um, mm. So it might be just something that you might want to look at. It could be a project for somebody within the practice. And I think people are quite quite happy to go home with a bit of goodie bag with, with, with some information in it. And um, and it's also quite a proud moment if you come in and, and you, you know, you're saying you've been planning a pregnancy and somebody's giving you information, they come back and tell you that they're pregnant and they've, thanks for your advice and they, you know, they've got their multivitamins on tap and they're taking the iodine and folic acid supplements. So, you know, just think about that. It's a good thing to get on board and I think it's a really good mm. thing to give to your patients if you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Jean, um, the answer to the question about written um, patient consent, um, look, I, like, like Jennifer has suggested, use the RACGP um, consent forms. Um, and again, that's a really good tool to be able to work through some of the, you know, the side effects and all of the issues around Implanon so that the, the client has an understanding around that. Um, and the answer, uh, Miss R, um, yes, there are um, midwives who are clinical nurse consultants who who do work with substance um, use during pregnancy. Um, the one that I, I'm have I'm based in Liverpool for one of my jobs, and that's a service called Jacaranda House, um, which is a drug and alcohol service, and there is a midwife there. And I, I I'm fortunate I, I do get some referrals from her um, for postnatal care. I think a few people like the folder idea. I actually liked it when I worked at family planning, so I pinched their idea mm, and put yeah. it into general practice. So it is a nice thing to give to people. So yeah. Um, for Alison, uh, there's a question there about obtaining consent for any procedure. Um, well, I think that we're con obtaining consent from anybody, regardless of whether they have a mental health condition or not. Um, that I think that's that's probably a given I, I'm, and I agree with you Cheryl. Um, and for Alison, I mean I have extra insurance but I think you need to sort of have talk with you know your, your GP or your, wherever you're working around what insurance you may need um, in order to insert implanons and certainly I have Guild through um, APNA which has been fabulous. Um, but we also do have it um, covered, you know, if you're a member of a, an association like the New South Wales Nurses and Midwives Association, there is pre professional indemnity insurance or your, your employer may actually c provide cover for that, but your employer would need to check that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Would you agree with so that? So on the decision yeah. support yep. tool, mm -hmm. just I'm just thinking about resources that, that you can give to your patients. The one that we've actually put the picture on that's the um, the Andrology Australia, Your Sperm, How to Look After Them. It's a really good little book to get hold of. Um, you can order them on. They've got really mm. good resources and um, they're quite helpful at sending them out. And it's a good, again, it's a good thing that you can actually give to your patients too. So um, I'll just show you what it looks like. And it's a really good little resource. Okay. So that's, that, those are the types of things that you might want to include in your, um, in your folders if you make some folders up. Well, that's about it, I think. Or is there so are there any more questions before we that's about it. sign off? Before. <laughs> No. Well, I think that was really, really great. And thank you, everyone who participated. Thank you, Joe and Ruth. Um, I think everyone's really had a learning, great learning experience. Just so you're aware that the um, the tool has been sent out in the primary times, as mentioned earlier. Um, some of you may or may not have received it yet. However. Both the PowerPoint and the decision support tool will be available at the, on the APNA website and we will be sending out an, a link through the e-news in the, in the next week or so. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, you will be able to download and laminate yourself as well as the, the high quality um, product that you've been sent out. So look, I'd really like to thank you all again. We've had a fabulous time. I hope that you've enjoyed it as well. We just have an exit survey that's about to come up. We'd love it if you could take the time to um, answer just Thanks. four brief questions. And um, thank, you. Thank, thank you again. Thank you very much for your sharing as well. I think it's that's been really, really good, good to be so, so sort of interactive. Yeah. Mm, absolutely.